and thanks for having me and for coming to listen. I hope that, um, that it is exciting for all of you. So I'm going to talk about quantifying the role that terrestrial ecosystems play in Earth's climate. Um, and this is a sort of overarching theme of a lot of the work that I've been doing in my lab over the last, um, I've been here now, I guess, seven years. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge and many collaborators that will come up as we go through the talk here, and, and, and most of my work has been funded by NSF. So this image that I have in the background here is a satellite image of greenness. And I like to start here because it shows you the scope in which I'm thinking of the interactions between the land surface and climate. I'm really interested in global scales. Um, and it also shows us that there is this very direct um, and strong interaction. We can see from the plant uh, activity on the land surface that there is a very direct imprint from climate. There's places that we know are very inhospitable to growing plants that have very little greenness, or places that have a lot of greenness, say tropical forests, and the summertime in the northern hemisphere image that are really green at high latitudes. So we can just see that plants care about climate. It's also a really functional way of thinking about how plants interact with the climate system. We're not dividing up which individual species live in different places. We're thinking about how they function in general and, and why that might matter. But in particular, um, my work is a little bit different in that I'm not only really thinking about how climate influences plants, but also how plants influence climate. So the other direction of this arrow, why does the atmosphere and the climate system care about what the plants are doing in the land surface? And I'm gonna tell you a couple of stories about that today. So this question that I'm really asking is where and how do plants influence climate? And to dig into that question a little bit more, we're gonna start um, by thinking about where that direct interaction takes place. So where do the plants really directly interface with the atmosphere? Um, and that happens at the surface, um, and it happens um, through energy fluxes and through carbon fluxes. Um, and water as well, but water is gonna be tied to energy. So I'm not gonna focus as much on the carbon fluxes today, um, but the way that plants exchange carbon and the um, things that govern how they exchange carbon are really tightly linked also to how they exchange energy. So they're, they're coupled together. So how do plants and climate interact? Well, um, plants and climate interact through exchanging, like I said, exchanging energy fluxes. Um, and plants are able to uh, modify all of these terms in the surface energy budget. So the surface energy budget um, has four terms in it. It's got shortwave fluxes, longwave fluxes, and then fluxes that are related to turbulent mixing of air, which includes sensible and late heat. Um, and each of these can be modified by plants, so we'll walk through them one at a time. So first, shortwave fluxes, that's sunlight. So sunlight coming in and how much gets reflected is influenced by plants. And specifically, it's influenced by the surface albedo, which is just um, a description of how reflective the surface is. Um, and the albedo of um, different plants, it varies. So uh, plants can have very different surface albedos, which is maybe obvious to people who think about plants all the time, but to people in an atmospheric science community, that's not always very obvious. Um, this image is just trying to demonstrate that we've got basically two kinds of plants here. We've got um, these broad leaf deciduous trees in the front, and we've got some spruce trees, these dark needle leaf trees in the background. And if you look on this hillside in the background, this, this picture is from Alaska, um, you can see this really bright swath here, and you guys have a really nice projector so you can actually see that it's green. Uh, this bright swath is a big patch of um, broad leaf trees, and it's surrounded by these darker and blue leaf trees. So even just from this image, it's really obvious that they have different amounts of sunlight that they're absorbing versus reflecting. So which, which kind of plant grows there is going to matter for how much sunlight gets absorbed. Plants can also influence what we call long wave energy fluxes. Long wave radiation is um, radiation in the more infrared wavelengths, which is what Earth is emitting back out to space. So that upward arrow is Earth's um, re-emission of energy. Uh, and the downward arrow is the emission that the atmosphere is having that's going towards the land surface. 
Uh, and these long wave fluxes are modified by how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, how much water is in the atmosphere, what the profile of temperature is, where the clouds are. Those things can be more indirectly modified by plants, but plants also participate in setting those profiles um, in the atmosphere. So that can influence what's coming down. The upper flux is really just a function of surface temperature. So whatever the surface temperature ends up being, um, it will radiate energy uh, associated with that temperature. Our next terms over here are the turbulent heat fluxes. So these are things that, um, these are energy fluxes that are um, dictated by a turbulent movement of air. And so um, if we start with sensible heat, this would be uh, influenced by obviously the, the temperature gradient, so how hot the surface is versus how hot the atmosphere is is going to set that flux, but also how rough the surface is will actually influence both of these. So taller vegetation tends to create a rougher surface, and shorter vegetation tends to create a smoother surface. You can get more turbulent air movement over a, 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 a taller canopy. And finally, but definitely not least, is this um, latent heat flux term over here on the right. And latent heat refers to the energy associated with the flux of water. So the turbulent um, flux of latent heat is the transfer of water from the land surface to the atmosphere. So it starts out as a liquid on the land surface and either evaporates or transpires through the plants um, and is released to the atmosphere as a gas. And that transfer from uh, liquid to gas has energy associated with it. So there's an energy transfer from the land surface to the atmosphere. And that energy is associated with the fact that the water is a gas. It goes out somewhere else. It may eventually re-release that latent energy in, uh, when it condenses in a cloud. But that's going to move the energy somewhere in the atmosphere. And we like to divide this one up into multiple pieces because it's actually comprised of evaporation and transpiration. Um, which are going to be governed by slightly different things. So we have evaporation off the soil surface. We can also have evaporation directly off of a plant canopy. Um, and then we have transpiration, which is directly controlled by, um, by plants. <coughs> and so let's talk a little bit more about transpiration. So transpiration is the flux of water um, through plants to the atmosphere. And we're going to zoom in here to a leaf. And on our leaves, we have stomata. And stomata are the, um, the valves through which plants exchange gases with the atmosphere. So plants need to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in order to make their living. They're going to fix that carbon into sugar and use it for all of their um, needs. But that carbon dioxide has to come from the atmosphere and into the plant. So the plant needs a way to get gas inside the leaf before it can do photosynthesis. And as it opens these stomata, it's going to lose water at the same time and that's transpiration. So that pathway of water through the plant is going to be really, really tied um, to uh, what's happening with photosynthesis and how plants open and close their stomata. So carbon in is really linked to water going out. And so the point of walking through this surface energy budget is so we can think back to it when we talk about some different examples of why changing plants influences climate, why it influences climate nearby those plants. Um, and it's because when you have a change in plants, maybe that's a change in which plants are growing there, maybe that's a change in how those plants are opening or closing their stomata or how much they're photosynthesizing or something else about um, their structure or function, that can change the surface energy budget. And by changing the surface energy budget, you can change um, local property, the local climate uh, environmental conditions like temperature, um, humidity near the surface, etc. And so changes in plant cover can really directly influence the climate nearby. Uh, we're going to talk also today about how it influences climate over broader scales as well. So I'm going to tell you two main science stories. Um, first, about the climate impacts of which plants grow where. So we'll look at changing forest cover, in this case I'll tell you a story about North America, so changing forest cover in different parts of North America and what the impacts of that are across the rest of the continent. Um, and the second story I'll tell you is, is how there's a climate impact associated with plants responding to a changing climate. So we know that plants care about the fact that the environment around them is changing and the concentration of carbon dioxide. They're going to respond to that, but that response has an impact on climate itself. 
But first, I want to tell you a little bit about the tools that I'm going to use for these problems. So for a lot of my work, um, but not all of it, I use tools like Earth System Models. So this um, is a full global climate model that also has plants in it. And this would be a sort of graphical depiction of that. In, in my case, I mostly use the community Earth System Model, which is one of these examples, but in some of the stuff I'll show you today, we'll look at a series of eight different groups that have done experiments with these. And so these models are representing all of the physics and dynamics of the atmosphere. They've got, um, they've got uh, additionally uh, changes in, in what's going on in the ocean. Um, they're representing processes on land, processes with sea ice, etc. So there's lots of components of the system that are represented. Um, and in my case, I'm going to be doing experiments with these models. I like to change, um, change something in the model and, and then look at what the climate impacts of that are. But on the land, I'll show you a little bit more about the processes that are represented on the land surface because that's a little bit more relevant to when we're making changes on the land surface. So on the land surface in particular, we don't need to see all the details of these, but we basically represent surface energy fluxes, just like I showed you with that terrestrial surface energy budget, which keep track of all of those energy fluxes. We're going to look at all of the fluxes of water coming in and out, um, as well as all the fluxes of carbon. Um, and so sometimes that carbon is going to be linked but, uh, to what's happening in the atmosphere um, in terms of whether it's going to cause warming or cooling. Uh, but in this first set of experiments, but we're still going to keep track of how much photosynthesis there is, how much leaf growth there is, how much um, that will affect sort of what the plant looks like. So there's many detailed processes occurring in lots of components of the system, but I focus mostly on the land. And I use these simulations to try to ask theoretical questions for the most part. So I can do experiments where I change what kind of vegetation is growing in a different place, I can change, um, I'll show you an example where we change just the surface properties, like just the surface albedo, or just the um, amount, the resistance to water flux. And then because we have our own world that we've created here, where we change something, we can compare it with what the, the control looks like. So we have a control experiment where we leave everything uh, the same, and then we change one very specific thing, and we can compare those two experiments, and we can figure out what the response to that one perturbation was. Uh, and in my case, I usually use a uh, pretty simple ocean, so this is this more detailed maybe than um, what we'd be looking at, but it's called a slab ocean or a mixed layer. So we have a little bit of ocean dynamics, but not a full complicated ocean. So there's a bunch of components to this system, but I'm going to be modifying things that are happening on the land. So first, I'd like to tell you about um, the climate impacts of changing which plants grow where. Uh, and we're going to look at a um, series of experiments that we did where we deforested different regions of the United States. Uh, and there's a long list of collaborators here, um, including several people from my lab, graduate student Marisa Lugu and postdoc Elizabeth Garcia, um, and a number of collaborators from the University of Arizona, Michigan State, um, etc. And so we wanted to know how different parts of the U.S. were connected to other places. And the basic idea is that uh, you could have a regional forest loss in one part, and this could apply outside of the U.S. as well, but a regional forest loss in one place, and that influences the atmosphere, and the atmosphere can transmit signals, essentially, that result in ecological responses somewhere else. And this is a general concept that I've been calling an ecoclimate teleconnection. We'll walk through a little bit more of what that means. But this is the idea that you can have a response that matters for the land surface somewhere far away from where the original perturbation in the land surface happens. So if you want to conceptualize what this looks like, you could think about, well, we have tree mortality, we the bark beetles. Um, what is the ecological response over a wider area to the fact that we lost trees here? So you'd expect there to be local impacts to these communities, but is there broader scale impact? And the reason why you might expect there to be is because the atmosphere um, connects these places. And we know many examples of where um, we have a perturbation to our Earth system, like an El Nino, for example, where there's really hot water 
anomalously hot water in part of the Pacific Ocean, and we know that that could influence our climate here. So the atmosphere um, transmits those signals through Rossby waves, basically it's like dropping a rock in the pond in the Pacific, and that signal ends up modifying how our local climate is um, in North America. And so we're looking at a sort of similar idea of how the land surface can initiate those same kind of changes. To walk through a little bit more specifically what that means, we actually might expect to take a path more like this. So we have some loss of forest cover that's going to locally change the transpiration, change the surface albedo, change the surface energy budget. That will influence the local atmosphere, which could influence atmospheric circulation. And that atmospheric circulation change will have impacts for what climate looks like in other places. Um, and because plants care about climate, you might have some ecological response to that climate perturbation. So to give you an even more specific example related to one of these experiments, we can take this um, depiction of the US here, we can deforest this little yellow region right here, and uh, we're going to be looking at a series of experiments across these different uh, outlying regions. So this one right here is sort of approximately California. We're going to take all the trees out of California, and that's going to result in a change in the transpiration rate somewhat locally, we see some changes happening elsewhere as well. Um, that leads to some change in circulation. I'm showing you here a pressure height in the atmosphere, which indicates a, a change in circulation. So the height of the 500 millibar pressure height. And that leads to, in this case, I'm showing you a change in surface temperature. So there's cooler surface temperatures in some places, warmer surface temperatures in others. Um, and that also leads to some response of um, plants. And so this is a change in the gross primary production, resulting from not just this temperature change, but all of the changes so initiated by this loss in forest cover in California. And we're going to look at a, a bunch of these experiments and, and think about um, the response of the primary production across the U.S., why it looks, why it looks that way relative to the um, deforestation. So to tell you a little bit more about these experiments, um, we've taken these eco-regions, which were uh, defined, or eco-climate regions, which were defined by the National Ecological Observation Network. Um, they roughly divide up the U.S. into uh, different eco-climate domains. And we took the 13 of them that had the most forest cover in them, and one at a time we took all the trees out in our, our model world, right? So those are pretty extreme changes in tree cover um, in each of those individual experiments. But we're interested in how it matters, you know, the fact that we forest on the west coast versus the east coast, etc. So this is what those domains look like, and those are out to be outlined on some of the other plots. And so one of the things we were really interested in was how does this loss of tree cover result in, um, in a change in productivity um, in other places. And so we could look at a map like this one. So this is, uh, again, the map of, the, uh, of North America. And this yellow region is denoting where we turned the trees into grasses. So we, did, we removed the trees and we replaced them with grasses. And the green and brown colors are showing the change in the annually average gross primary production due to the tree loss in this area. So following deforestation here, we get more productivity in these green places, and we get less productivity in the brown places. And so, so far I haven't shown you all of those linkages, but you can see that there is some response that's occurring um, due to this deforestation event here. And again, it's a large deforestation event. So I'm going to zoom out on this one, and then I'm going to show you all of the experiments at once. So here's the desert southwest region, there in the middle. Um, and now I'm going to pop up all of our 13 experiments. And what I want you to see is that there is a difference in the response depending on where the deforestation occurs. So they are ordered, they're going to be ordered roughly from the most overall negative response to the most overall positive response here. 
So that's what this looks like, and it's a little bit overwhelming. But we're not looking at all the details here, but you can kind of compare some end members. You can see that it starts out browner overall, going, and then it gets greener overall as we get towards the end here. And again, each of these yellow regions are where the trees were lost in each experiment. So here's Pacific Northwest here. Um, we lost that sliver of trees here, and we see um, a response of uh, greening in the middle of the country and browning in the southwest there. So this is one, one uh, is our estimate of the, we're using this as kind of our estimate of the ecological response to this deforestation. And one point that I'd like to make here is that the impact of deforestation really depends on where, the, or the impact overall really depends on where the deforestation occurs. It can go either up or down. Um, in this case of Cal the mostly California domain here, it gets mostly a reduction across the U.S. And in the case of this uh, Appalachian domain here, we get mostly an increase in productivity across the U.S. And somewhere in the middle over here, some places are greener and some places are browner. But it, it does really depend on the location of the forest loss. So one question you might have is, well, why is the productivity changing? Why do the plants care? Um, and we can see pretty clearly that the, there's some simple ways to explain that aspect of it. So the productivity is generally going down when the summers get either hotter or drier. And so this is now showing, again, it doesn't really matter which of these lines is which, but in general, um, when the summers get warmer, we see less productivity. And so this is the, um, this is the slope for each of these uh, each of these different domains in a different color. And there's some exceptions to that. Say this yellow line right here, which is one of the uh, domains in Alaska, gets more productive um, when the summer gets uh, warm. But in a lot of places, when the summers get warmer, they get less. They get more productive. I'm sorry, summers get warmer, they get less productive. Yeah. Just for clarification, is are those lines? The cells inside the region or are continental? These are the um, locally. So this is saying that um, for each of the, there's 13 dots that make up each of these lines, which is each of the experiments. Actually 12 we left out when they, we changed itself. But it says that, um, so how did Alaska respond to each of the experiments depending on what the temperature over Alaska did? And so we average them if we go back here over the, uh, whatever the domain outline was. So it takes whatever grid cells lie in there. So there's more than two points in those lines. It's not just a deforested, not deforested. This is looking at just do we think plants in that place are doing better when the summers are warmer or cooler. And in most places they do better when the summers get a little bit cooler with the exception of the higher latitudes. And similarly when the summers get drier, um, they do worse. So weather summers tend to lead to more productivity. This is sort of the proximate reason. Why did the primary productivity change? Well, the local climate conditions got better for growth, and what does better mean? Well, in this case, it seems to be pretty well summarized by having a cooler summer uh, or a wetter summer. Yeah. Is that the Pacific Southwest that's pretty productive and gets better when it gets warmer and gets much worse when it gets wetter? It doesn't make sense. Pacific well, there's, there's a purple line right up there at the top. The, this one here? Yeah. Yeah. There's not much change in precipitation in any of the experiments, so it's a little hard to tell how meaningful that one's going to be. But it does look like it is, is uh, generally doing okay in the summer when it's getting warmer. I mean, I might expect that they would be really dominated by wintertime rainfall rather than summertime rainfall, so this might not be the right metric for every domain. But if we had to sort of generalize across all the domains, this did the best job of telling us, you know, approximately why are they, you know, why are we getting these responses? Well, it's, it's basically because of those two climate factors changing. And then the question is, well, why are the climate factors changing that way? Um, and I'm not going to totally answer that one for you here, because for each of these 13, for, for each of these 13 experiments, we really need to come up with a different reason for why deforestation in this region, you know, specifically made the, the summertime conditions in this other region change. And so I have some, I can talk about that with you later, but it's a little bit uh, 
having all 13 of these is a little bit much to explain. So that's something I'm also looking into more. Um, but we can understand why the productivity changes uh, in response to the local climate. We're still working on sort of clean explanations for why deforestation leads to the climate changes in those other places across this large group of experiments. But one of the points I'd like to make is that it varies a lot spatially, and it's not just a function. Um, so there's, there's more, there's definitely some spatial component to it that's not just a function of how many trees. So uh, this is now summarizing these, uh, these plots here, just now averaging over the US. Um, we can go from the same ordering of these experiments from the most negative overall response over the US to the most positive overall response in the US. Uh, and so this is that we saw the California domain over here, and the mid-Atlantic shows up all the way over here as having the most positive response. So this is how those, those look if you summarize them all just by one average change for the U.S. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, next the forest area that got removed in each of these experiments. So uh, down here is plotting the forest area for each experiment, and this is a snapshot of what that looks like. So we have lots of forest area um, tree cover in the Pacific Northwest here. Uh, but our domain is small, so we still don't have a ton of forest area that's removed in that experiment. But you can see there's definitely not a direct correspondence between the area of the forest cover that's changed and the total amount of response that happens. Uh, and <coughs> it's something you might expect initially, but we know that the atmosphere is going to care about locations differently. And so the, the takeaway here is that that location seems to matter a lot. Um, and to illustrate that a little bit farther, I'm going to take this top plot and just divide it by the bottom plot to show you the sort of relative contribution based on the area that was removed um, to changing the productivity. And we can see that this, this domain um, in California really pops out. Um, you can guess that here because it has this, one of the smallest areas um, as being having a sort of outsized impact. So it doesn't have a lot of area of forest that's removed, but it has a lot of impact. Um, and the main point of this is to, to reiterate that it's the location that the location is very important here and not just the total area of forest that's changed. And that's because the atmosphere is going to be sensitive to these different locations. Um, it's going to have different sensitivity. So we also wanted to look at how the domains, um, these different regions, cared about forest loss elsewhere. So, so far we've been looking at what happens if you deforest in one place, what happens in lots of other places. We wanted to flip it around and say, okay, if I care about this one region, how sensitive is it to if deforestation happens elsewhere? So this next plot, um, I'm going to walk you through a little bit. So uh, what we're showing is this pink region, and we're looking at the response in this pink region due to forest loss in all these other regions. So the experiment that we're looking at is actually all of them. So if you take out this region here, Pacific Southwest in California, this value that's plotted here is actually what happens in this domain that's Florida. So if the map is really brown, it's showing you that Florida is pretty much losing, um, losing productivity uh, in almost all places where we took forest out. So they're always kind of losing out. It's going to give us a sense of um, how consistently they are sensitive to where the forest location, forest loss occurs. So there's big decreases for this um, domain here in Florida. And we'll move that one up here. Um, I'm going to show you two other examples to start with. So here, and they're going to be the same order as we looked at before. So here again is our California domain. And you can see that it's in most places. So it pretty much always increases in productivity when forest is lost elsewhere. Um, and so there's the response uh, of something on the west coast is, is somewhat different than the response of something in the southeast of the US. Uh, and then here's an example from this domain uh, here, uh, the Ozarks domain, which is showing you that sometimes it has decreases and sometimes it has increases, depending on where the forest loss was happening. 
And I will show you all of these as well. And this time there's 18 of them because there were 18 domains, so every domain has a response, even if it didn't have a deforestation experiment. Uh, and they're, they're again ordered the same way until we get to the end of the experiments, and then we have the, uh, the rest of the domains here. And the main point here is that some of these domains benefit and some of them lose from forest loss elsewhere, and that's also a function of their location. So sometimes they're going to um, they're going to be in a part of the country where forest loss elsewhere is improving the, the climate um, that plants need in those places. So just a, a quick summary so far: the the where really matters. So forest loss leads to these responses that are far away, these eco-climate teleconnections. Plants in other places care about the fact that something happened uh, in another location because the atmosphere can communicate that signal and it can influence the local climate those plants are experiencing. Uh, it depends on where the forest loss occurs, not just how much there is. And some of these domains have a much bigger impact across North America than others. In particular, we saw the Pacific Southwest, uh, which is a place we know there's been a lot of um, forest mortality in the last Last and some of these domains are more sensitive to forest loss elsewhere, which is also a function of where they are. So I'd be happy to talk about this more with you offline because we have a paper in the last year looking at this. But I'm going to move on and I'm going to talk about um, a little bit more fundamentally what is really the climate response to changing trees and why. So if we have grass turning into trees or in that case, we're going in the arrow in the other direction, trees turning into grass, but some big transition in plant cover. Um, we really want to know, is it the albedo, or is it the transpiration, or what aspect of the plant actually mattered that the climate cared about? And this is something that was hard to parse out in experiments like the ones I just showed you. It's hard to change those individual factors. We sort of change everything into something else. So ideally, we could change one aspect at a time, so we could isolate whether each of these different factors related to the plants matter. Um, that's hard to do. Uh, so it turns out for something like the surface albedo, it's actually a function of a whole bunch of things. Um, and when we make these changes, we're changing many properties at the same time. But something like albedo in our simulations is actually an emergent property. We don't set the surface albedo. We set what the surface of a leaf looks like. We calculate how many leaves there are, and we end up with an emergent albedo of the entire surface. Um, so uh, this was really hard to do with a regular, typical land surface model, which are quite complex. And so. Um, we in my group have built a very, very simple land model to test the atmospheric responses. So we really want to know about how the atmosphere cares about the land surface. So I like to say we wanted to know what trees did to the atmosphere, so we got rid of all the trees. And we made something very simple. So you can just set the surface albedo. You can set how much water there can be in the soil. You can set the evaporative resistance. Um, and we can test the atmospheric response to these things. And I should say by we, I actually mean Maurice Oku has built this, uh, this tool, which we're now having a lot of fun trying to play with to understand why is the atmosphere sensitive to what and where and how does it matter. So to just give you one example of that, we're going to look at um, a series of experiments she did where she looked at how much the surface temperature changes when you change the surface albedo. So we're going to change the surface albedo by um, 0.1 units, that's kind of like a switch between a very dark tree and a, a, a grass, let's say. We're going to make the surface darker and we're going to see how much the surface temperature changes. And so this map looks like that. Um, this is a change in surface temperature for a change in albedo of uh, 0.1. So we make the surface darker and it gets warmer. These are all positive values. And there's a little bit of spatial pattern to this. But it's kind of washed out, and the reason is because I'm just showing you how the land surface itself responds if it can't communicate with the atmosphere at all. If we just recalculate what the land surface temperature would be by readjusting those energy fluxes, this is how much surface temperature change you get. But if now we allow the atmosphere to also respond, 
I should say, we just changed the albedo everywhere. We just made it the same. Very idealized, not related to real plants, but it's a thought experiment. If we now let the atmosphere respond, we get this change in temperature. And so um, the reason why we can't see very much structure here is because it's so much larger when we allow the atmosphere to respond. And some of this is very simple. It's just the local atmosphere allowing um, changes in, in long wave fluxes to happen locally. So some of it's more complicated, changes in circulation or cloud cover. Um, but we see that there's way bigger response when we allow the atmosphere to respond. And just to quantify that for you, we're going to take this fully coupled version, which has what I would call the land only, or the forcing from this change in albedo, and then we get the forcing plus the feedback from the atmosphere. We're going to subtract this one from this one, and we're going to look at how much more response we got um, in temperature because the atmosphere was responding. And so that pattern looks like this. And um, you can see that it's large, it's positive almost everywhere. We get more warming when we allow the atmosphere to respond to a darker land surface. But it varies spatially. So in the tropics, we actually get more of the answer from just the land surface. There's not as much extra temperature change because of the atmosphere. But in high latitudes, we're getting a lot of more of the extra temperature change from letting the atmosphere respond. And so we can start to think about um, how this relates to where the atmosphere is sensitive, um, how this uh, projects onto the ways in which we need to think about the climate impacts of, say, land use change. A lot of experiments in these types of models that are done to quantify how much climate change you get due to land use change are actually um, done without the atmosphere, and we think that that response is way too small. So the, the secondary summary for this section is to, uh, to note that the, um, the atmospheric feedback to these land surface changes are really large, uh, and we can't quantify those impacts without the atmosphere. So a bit of a side note related to our experiments in the, in the US, but just um, we are trying to think really critically about the atmospheric piece as well. So I'd like to tell you a second story about the climate impacts of how plants respond to a changing climate. And this is really thinking about um, plant physiology and how it responds to climate change. Um, and there's a number of other collaborators here from a whole variety of institutions uh, that I've worked with on this. And I want to motivate this by reminding you that temperatures are expected to increase on Earth. Um, associated with climate change, and that this is because of greenhouse gases. So this is because of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere, um, mostly due to carbon dioxide. And associated with this increase in temperature, we expect climate impacts um, on land. Um, and one of the ones that is frequently discussed is that droughts are predicted to become more severe. And so this is a map of um, an estimate of the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which is an index of, that we use presently to measure how severe a drought is. It's showing you how that will change by the end of the century under a high greenhouse gas emission scenario. So these pink and red colors are really big increases in drought severity. Uh, and it's increasing across much of the land area. So that looks pretty dire. But I want to back up and ask us to think like a tree. So we've got our tree here and it's got our leaf, it's got its leaves. Those leaves have the stomata. And remember that carbon going in is very closely related to water going back out again. Um, and so these, the, the process of taking up carbon dioxide is very coupled to the process of losing water. And we actually describe that um, using an equation um, for stomatal resistance or stomatal conductance. This is one example of what that equation might look like. It's got a couple of factors in it. It's got uh, some factor related to humidity, in this case the relative humidity, some factor related to photosynthesis, represented here by A for assimilation, uh, and something related to the carbon dioxide concentration. So that's, that's how we model the opening and closing of these, uh, of these stomata, um, and how it uh, fairly well describes what happens at a leaf level when you subject plants to changes in their environment. But I just told you that greenhouse gases are increasing. So what happens 
Now we've got a cross section of the stomata here. We're bringing CO2 into the leaf and water is escaping at the same time. What happens as we increase CO2? Well, we've got a lot more carbon dioxide outside the leaf now. And the plant can do a couple of things. It can photosynthesize more, and maybe it's less limited by the availability of carbon, so maybe it increases the photosynthetic rate. Um, it can also close its stomata. So the carbon dioxide here on the equations on the bottom, so that would, if there's more of it, it would tend to um, increase conduct, written in conductance, so increase the conductance. If the photosynthesis increases, that would tend to decrease the conductance. So those are working in opposition to each other. So CO2 itself in the atmosphere is going to have multiple effects. <clears throat> it's going to have the really obvious radiative effect. A just plotted temperature here over land, temperature increase associated with a big increase in CO2. So it, it happened everywhere. I just plotted it only over land. Um, so when you add lots of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, it makes the plant hotter. But we know that it's also going to influence plant physiology. It's going to influence photosynthetic rates. It's going to influence the opening and closing of stomata. And so um, these two things are possibly working in opposite directions. It turns out that you do get um, the physiological responses of plants. So accounting for these factors of plants responding to CO2 does lead to a very small temperature increase. You can see these maybe slight yellow colors which compared to the increase in temperature associated with um, rising carbon dioxide is really small, but it's actually not that small. It's still like, you know, close to a degree or more temperature change in those places. Uh, and the radiative effects of CO2, so the fact that it's getting hotter, is also going to modify um, how stomata are operating. So we can separate these effects out in a, in a climate model where we can, we can play games where we can let only the plants see carbon dioxide or we can let only the atmosphere see the carbon dioxide we can try to figure out with how those different factors are influencing um, influencing things like drought on land and I should say this this is following from um, work by Pierce Sellers back in 1996 which is not new at all but we've got this breakdown of experiments where we have only the atmosphere seeing the carbon dioxide but the plants just see a fixed value one where only the plants see the carbon dioxide increasing, but the atmosphere doesn't. It doesn't know that there's a greenhouse effect. And a fully coupled one where they both see the CO2 increasing. And I'm going to show you an average of um, about seven different models that did these experiments. A big increase in CO2. So we're going to go from, we're going to quadruple CO2. So remember that the radiative effects, that's what makes temperature go up, right? It makes the temperature increase. The two different lines here are two different uh, guesses as to what the emissions of CO2 might be. So more carbon dioxide, higher temperatures, less carbon dioxide, lower temperatures. So we add lots of CO2, so temperatures go up a lot. And in general, we think that that should make um, evapotranspiration on land go up. It's going to make more demand for water by the atmosphere. So I'm going to show you a series of plots where we look at evapotranspiration. Uh, evapotranspiration here. Um, so this is the flux of water out of the land surface. And we've got atmospheric CO2 down here on the x-axis increasing. So it goes from 280 parts per million, which is approximately what it was in 1850, up to 1140, which is a little bit more than the highest emission scenario that we expect for uh, the end of the century. So this is a really big increase in CO2. And you can see that if we just consider the rate of effects, basically the atmosphere getting hotter, we get more evaporation out of evapotranspiration out of land. It goes up like this. But if we take the flip side of that and we say only let the plants see the CO2, we don't let the atmosphere see the CO2 at all, and we just look at how plant physiology and plant growth respond to carbon dioxide, this is the evapotranspiration as carbon dioxide increases. It goes down pretty significantly. So, evapotranspiration is dropping when the plants see the CO2. They're closing their stomata, basically. They're growing more, but they're also closing their stomata. So basically, they're, they're more than compensating, um, and so the overall, there's less water loss. And if both of these things happen together, you take some path down the middle, right? So they, they, they're counteracting each other. 
that it's getting hotter, demanding more water, that the plants are closing their stomata, and so that is preventing that water from getting out, and we end up with an evapotranspiration that's sort of flat, maybe, maybe down, but I would say it's basically flat. And so the reason why this happens, why we get more evaporation as it gets hotter, is that the atmosphere is demanding more water, and so the potential to evaporate water goes up as carbon dioxide increases. Um, and so now we're just plotting this, this theoretical construct, which is how much water does the atmosphere want? The potential to evaporate water. And I've now separated out all the seven different models here. And you can see that the, even in this fully coupled experiment here, they all demand more water from the land surface. The atmospheric demand goes up for all of them. But the actual amount of water that comes out of the land surface stays really flat. And so that is this the model closure, which we can identify from making these specific experiments where we can parse out what happened just because the plant saw the CO2 or the atmosphere saw the CO2. And we can see that this um, potential to evaporate water doesn't follow what actually happens when we evaporate water. But it turns out this potential to evaporate water, this is actually the metric that we use for lots of things, including many droughts. But we, um, we look at a lot of climate impacts and we say, how dry is the atmosphere? And therefore, what does that mean for what's happening on land? But there's a, a decoupling between these two things. The actual water flux has become less and less related to the potential for the demand that the atmosphere has because plants can close their stomata. And so the physiological response of plants um, is making it much less relevant to exactly what's happening. And so the consequence of that is if we come back to looking at drought, this is now my version of that same plot of the Palmer Drought Severity Index. We can see that um, in this, this same experiment, we get a much more severe drought over uh, widespread land areas. 70% of land areas see an increase in drought by the end of the second, or by the end of this large increase in CO2 when we use something like this Palmer Drought Severity Index. And this has that potential, it uses that potential to evaporate water as the driver for whether there's a, um, a major driver for looking at if there's drought. And if we look at something that does not have a potential but uses the actual simulated um, evapotranspiration, which considers many of these plants, considers all of these plant responses, we can see that the difference the actual rainfall coming in and the actual evapotranspiration is not nearly as severe. And these aren't exactly the same index here, but you can see that although it is drier, over 36% of land, that's just all places that got drier at all, it's not nearly as severe. Um, and in some places you get a, quite a different sign. And the reason is because there isn't very much change in the evapotranspiration. So this mostly looks like the change in the precipitation pattern. And we don't know that super well. That's definitely uncertain. Um, so I should say, major caveats here, we don't necessarily understand everything about why the evapotranspiration should follow this pattern or if we accurately, you know, accurately represented that. But it suggests that these plant responses are really having a big lever on what happens with the water flux and that that's important for these climate impacts. So we are probably pretty severely overestimating how bad droughts are by using an index that only considers how dry the atmosphere is. And there are even atmospheric variables um, that respond really strongly to plants. So this is looking at relative humidity change over land. And we've got our three experiments again. <coughs> the fully coupled one, you can see that relative humidity is dropping over a lot of land areas. So it's getting, the air is getting drier. But this is the, the drop in relative humidity due to the greenhouse effects, due to the radiative effects, and this is the drop in relative humidity due to the physiological effects. And so the plant responses, the plant contributions to relative humidity are quite large, especially in places that have a lot of productivity, like tropical forests, where stomata closure um, is leading to a lot less water release into the atmosphere, and it's making the atmosphere drier near the surface. And so this is just a reminder that this, um, this matters even for things that we consider to be atmospheric variables have this very strong plant signal in them, 
And whether or not we think that this is a perfect representation of the plant responses is suggests that those plant responses are adding a really significant component of uncertainty, or at least um, part of the signal to the response that we see when we look at everything coupled together. And then this even matters for rainfall. So one <laughs> tropical rainfall actually has this large signal from plants in it too. Um, so again, the same breakdown is our fully coupled response of, um, of rainfall. And again, rainfall is highly uncertain in terms of how we represent it. But if we break it down into these two experiments where we look just at the physiological responses and just at the response to radiation, we can see that a lot of the answer in these tropical land areas, which just maybe you know, concentrated to right here, if you look at the full response, about half of the answer is actually coming from the plant physiological responses. And fun story, it gets wetter in Indonesia and drier in South America, and they're both due to stomata closure. So over Indonesia, it gets the stomata closed, it gets warmer, you get more sensible heating, you've got lots of water, so you lift your air, it rains more. But over the Amazon, if you stop putting as much water into the atmosphere because the stomata closed, then you get less rainfall because you get less recycling of that rain. So I just think it's fascinating to think about how these plant responses are actually responsible for um, things that we consider part of the physical climate system. And most people aren't thinking about how plant responses to changing climate um, influence those factors. But as I said, there's uncertainties associated with what these plant responses are, and definitely with what the precipitation responses are. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. But I would say that doesn't mean that, uh, it, it really just says that these plant responses are important and whatever size we think they are is, is having a big influence on what we think surface climate looks like over land. And one additional caveat is that predicting the future is really hard. So plants like respond physiologically by closing their stomata, losing a bit less water. But it's also possible they might die faster, but droughts do happen. So um, this isn't to say that we know how to represent all of the responses to drought. We really don't know how to represent plant mortality yet. So overall, these models predict there'll be more water available, about the same amount of water available on land, but it doesn't appear to be getting ubiquitously drier. Um, but plant mortality could increase even if the drought occurrence is constant. So if you have a drought occurring and it's hotter now, that drought might impact plants a lot more. We really don't know how to model that, so that's not included here. So to summarize the second part of the talk, um, the potential amount of water flux, so this demand that the atmosphere has is unstable relative to the actual water flux as carbon dioxide concentrations change because plants are responding. And so it's not a good metric <coughs> to use over, over changes in carbon dioxide, particularly going into the future into high values of carbon dioxide. So we need to be really careful predicting climate impacts that uh, ignore these plant responses even if they're uncertain. So the plant responses are uncertain, but if you assume that there's no plant response, you're making an assumption that's pretty far outside of where we think the answer should be. Um, and even these atmospheric variables, like relative humidity and rainfall of the tropics, can have a large influence from the plant responses to changing the climate. So if we come back around to the, the bigger question of where and how plants influence climate. Um, I talked today about how the change in climate is a function of the magnitude, the location, the plant type. Um, land surface changes are magnified by the atmosphere. Uh, and the physiological responses to uh, reduce the occurrence of drought and make the land a little bit wetter, they also precipitation. But really that these, uh, the main take home is that it's critical to include these plant responses in our climate predictions and to think thoughtfully about how they're influencing um, climate impacts that we're asking for. Thank you. And we have time for questions. You can be like a trap. Okay, great. Uh, we'll go over here first. So you should have some idolized uh, some previous narrow simulations by removing trees in specific regions. And which is very interesting, but uh, here I have three questions. And the first is, so what is the implication of those results? So can we use them as guidelines for 
uh, geoengineering or something like that. And the second is, have you tried more realistic scenarios by considering uh, ecological disturbances like live wildfires and weather events? And which possibly leads to my third question is, uh, so have you considered uh, those fire disturbances in your response to climate change? Great, okay. So the, I'm remembering the second two questions and forgetting the first one. The, can you repeat them anyway? I can hear it. Yeah. The implications of those uh, idolized the implications of the ideal one? Idealized? Yeah, by removing, removing trees in those uh, different regions. Oh, right. So could we use those for like actual decision making? Yeah. I think that was your or question. So the experiments or uh, thinking about geoengineering. So this experiments where I took out trees in different parts of the U.S. Could we actually use those to either make decisions or think about geoengineering? And um, I would say that I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that whatsoever. I think there's still a scientific exploration of uh, trying to understand how the system works. Um, I would want to know a lot more about how robustly we understood that those atmospheric responses were consistent if we use different ways of estimating the atmosphere. Um, and as you said, those are really big changes in forest cover. But I think it illustrates these important scientific points about how the location of the forest matters. Um, and we can start to piece together what to do with that. So we are trying to, to use them in some ways in that direction. But I wouldn't want to make um, too many specific decisions. I think of them more as a conceptual tool at this point of how these regions may be connected together. And I mostly use these models in general for hypothesis generation. So we can we use those experiments to create hypotheses that we can come up with more ways of testing. Um, and then yeah, the second question is yeah. uh, some more realistic scenarios. Like oh right, yeah, more realistic scenarios, and then how we considered wildfire responses. So uh, there are ways of representing wildfires in these simulations, and so there are there's some fire response. I don't think the fire response is very well simulated um, and probably not done to satisfaction. So I would say we've done that poorly at best. It would be interesting to look into that more. And then in terms of more realistic distributions of plant changes, that's definitely um, something that I'd like to look into. Um, more. We've been working our way down in scale, so I will tell you, despite the fact that those are very large experiments, they are much smaller than the experiments we've done before. So um, we could look. I've looked previously at what happens. You know, if we take all of North American tree cover or all of North American uh, uh, grass cover. So I was actually a little bit surprised that we got the magnitude of response that we did from those smaller regions, even though those regions are still really large. And so now, because I'm I like to start with the bigger hammer and work my way down because if you don't see anything with the smaller experiments, it's hard to know why you didn't see a response. And so now that we're trying, we're sort of understanding what those responses might look like, we can start to think about how it scales. We have done some experiments where we do scale um, more theoretically, not tied to um, real forest loss patterns, um, but we've looked at, at scaling and thought about does it, do, do these responses scale linearly with forest area? Um, and we find that the local climate responses don't really, they have a threshold response that really depends on how much water is available. So if you have water available, you get one kind of response, and if you start running out of water, you get a different response. And that's because you switch from having late heat fluxes to sensible heat fluxes. So we're trying to come up with some um, scientific conceptual things like that, but I would like to look at more realistic distributions of forest loss as well. A uh, couple of things. First of all, my geographers obviously are not pleased to see the equilibrium maps, which so often don't get used to these models that have non equilibrium uh, grid cells, so thank you for that. But uh, my question is in the first part of the talk, I was expecting you to tell, you told a story about the importance of climate and location in driving how teleconnections work essentially. I didn't, I was expecting to hear something about how the climate it, or the, the atmospheric circulation. I, mean, yeah. I was expecting a circulation story, something about waves and yep. um, responses of those to changes in the flow 
Yes. Did you, did you, did you, did you know anything about that? Are you speculating? Or what, what is actually? Yeah. So the east versus west is pretty striking? Yeah. So we haven't come up with a nice, clean way of explaining those 13 experiments, which is why I didn't tell you that story here. I definitely have other projects where I have nice explanations for how the teleconnections work and why. And I'd say that is one of my major frustrations with what we haven't finished yet with this one. Um, I do think there's something to do with the West Coast versus the East Coast. We looked at a bunch of different factors to try to identify what can explain most of these experiments together and haven't come up with a nice way to do that. So I think maybe that was too hard of a challenge and we need to just go and try to explain them more individually. Can you pull out from those models like the weightiness of the, uh, the jet stream? Yep, we have all that kind of information in the atmosphere. So we could look at that more. I'm sort of person limited at the time, so I, at the moment. So I have all that simulation. I'm just really excited about it, wants to look at it. We have a lot of output, like seven terabytes of output to look at. Um, but yes, I agree with you that I'd like to know more about that. I will say for other experiments we've done, we have some really nice stories about how those teleconnections happen. Um, particularly if you make big changes in one hemisphere but not the other, then we get known kind of responses of the atmosphere that lead to shifts in circulation that have teleconnections in the tropics um, that's driven by that sort of interhemispheric energy gradient, things like that. But I don't have a great set of, I don't have a nice story for you about North America. So you're right, it was missing. Right. I mean, uh, first off, I just want to say thanks. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, and I have kind of a follow-up question to Dan's because um, I was wondering about the mechanisms in that first part, right? So there, there's like the mechanism you're asking about, the sort of spatial connectivity with yeah. the atmospheric circulation. But um, one of the other things I was wondering about is how each of those regions are treated in the model, given that like you've got both on the sending and the receiving end differences in like evergreen versus deciduous versus needle and broadleaf um, and how like some of this, I was just imagining in my head like the East Coast, West Coast thing, like you could imagine some of those patterns emerging even if there's not a spatial process but just based on where the vegetation exists in there. How, how much of the model incorporates all of those different functional things? Yeah, so you mean, uh, so, so there is a distribution of what kinds of plants grow where. We don't have a lot of granularity in that, but we would capture some of the categories you were talking about, like needle leaf versus broadleaf. Um, and so we start with some base distribution of that, and then we took all the trees that were there and turned them into grass. So the experiment is a little bit different in those different places. We can say what was the resulting albedo change or transpiration change associated with that. Um, and you're right. The, the proximate, like the response of the productivity in those regions would also depend on what kind of plants were there. So it's not a super clean experiment. Um, it's part of the reason why the, the idealist experiments, you know, are a little much more disconnected from reality, but can be very, very clean. Um, when we start trying to actually change the plant types around, we end up with a lot of these like, well, did it go up because that kind of plant did better? Um, and if a different kind of plant had been there, it would have responded differently. Yeah. Like one last one, question. Oh, oh sorry, just really quick. The one in yeah. particular, California, like stood out with extremely yeah. high leverage, right? And it's got a unique climate as yeah. well as it's the only region where you've got, no matter if you're needle leaf or broadleaf, you're evergreen pretty much in California. Yeah. And well, yeah, yeah. as Doug pointed out, that it, it had a different, it, it was productive when there was deforestation elsewhere, but it probably cares about different types of climate changes, like happening in the winter instead of in the right. summer. Um, so there's those kind of things as well, which is one of the reasons why we got so uh, why it's been challenging with this these 13 experiments because there's so many different things happening to try to parse out all of the, the different pieces. I tend to try to like to keep them simple. One last question before we okay. break. Well, over here first. Sorry. <laughs> this isn't my area of work, but I'm curious if there's empirical data. So with the growth of forests in the east. You know, those are kind of big changes like you were showing here where deforestation does yeah. they corroborate the results? It's a great question. I and I would love if you would sit on the NSF panel that's reviewing my proposal proposing to look at that. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. There's uh, there, I, there's
really obvious test cases that we could look at to see if we could find observational evidence. I think it's going to be challenging to find that observational evidence because the climate system is really noisy. And although these signals, we can isolate them in the climate model because we can really quash out a lot of the rest of the noise, it's going to be hard, but I think we have to try. Um, and so there's the example of reforestation in the eastern U.S., there's deforestation in the Amazon, and there's, um, and there's, there's forest loss occurring across the western U.S. I think those, if you have other ideas for other big perturbations to the land surface that have occurred um, in some kind of time period in which we have observations we can look at. So in the Arctic? Sorry? Shrub increase in the Arctic? Yeah, right, greening in the Arctic, shrubs and other things, yep. Yeah, okay, so well, uh, I'd like to look for that. Thank you.